Ephesians chapter 6. Would you find that? We are in this series and drawing eventually to a conclusion, the wonderful works of amazing grace, as we have been making our way through the book of Ephesians. Usually we don't take this long to get through a six-chapter book, um, but this book is a wonderful book. I think it's one of the mountain peak books, not lessening any of the rest of the epistles that Paul wrote, but I think the book of Ephesians is one of the mountain peaks of his works, especially for the Christian who wants to understand what happened to them when they got saved. Paul takes three chapters to describe our salvation, and boy, he goes deep. He right away, in fact, in, in the opening verses of chapter number one, he delves into the depths of our salvation in God before the foundation of the world, laying out the plan of salvation and how man, who he hadn't even created yet, would one day be redeemed. And for the next three chapters, uh, Paul tells us all about this wonderful salvation. And then he turns a corner at chapter 4 and begins to discuss, because we're saved, how should we live? And he tells us all about practical Christianity in chapter 4, 5, and 6. And we have, for the last few weeks, been in the last major topic of the book. And in fact, it's about what Lisa just sang about. It's about spiritual warfare and God's call to us to put on the whole armor of God. He says that twice, by the way. He emphasizes not just putting on the armor, but putting on the whole armor of God. He tells us in verses 10 through 13, you're engaged in a spiritual battle, and he describes our relentless, uh, our relentless enemy there in verse number 11, uh, or verse number 12, rather. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He named him in verse number 11. He said he's the devil, and he attacks you with wiles. That's an interesting word, one I haven't used since the last time we read Ephesians chapter 6. It just simply means those tricky, dangerous schemes that he attacks us with. He's a conniver. He has had a long time to study human psychology and human sociology. He is not omniscient. I was talking to someone this week, and I, I reinforced this to you. The devil is not omniscient. He is not omnipresent, and he is not omnipotent. Only our God has those three things. A lot of times we talk about the devil as if he is here in this room, and he's also over in Russia, or he's over in Afghanistan. He is not omnipotent, or he's not omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. He is not God, but boy, he's a powerful enemy. I'll remind you again, too, that people are not your enemy. The devil is your enemy. He's your enemy, and he is relentless in his attacks on us. He can't take your salvation. If you're a child of God, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, he can't take that away. But he can attack your effectiveness as a Christian. He can attack your joy as a Christian, and he can hinder the glory of God being seen in you. So he doesn't give up. He just comes after us, and he keeps coming after us. So in these verses, in this spiritual battle, God calls on us to stand. He says that three times in verse 11, verse 13, and verse 14. He calls on us to stand as Christians. And we looked at this especially last week when we were talking about the shoes of peace. When he calls on us to stand, he's encouraging a defensive position for us. We are supposed to stand on the ground which God has given us and not give it up. You know if you study any military strategy, or perhaps some of you are veterans and you've maybe even a war vet, you know there are defensive tactics and there are offensive tactics. Paul is describing here our defensive tactics. Stand. You've won this, you, you've, you've won this ground. God has given you this ground, so stand and defend it. He's going to tell us elsewhere to offensively go after the world, and that's, how we, that's where we do our evangelistic outreach, and we seek to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. But here he tells us in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may, able, you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore. Don't give up this ground. What is that ground? Well, it's all these blessings that God has given to us. Truth and salvation and grace. The church. Peace. Don't give, don't give Satan ground on any of that. 
stand. And how do we do that? By putting on the whole armor of God. If we want to keep those things that God has given us, we have to stand and we have to hold ground that we've already won. And if we are going to stand in the evil day, we are called here to put on the whole armor of God. And in your New Testament, if you write in your Bible, this particular Bible I have, I don't write in this one. I loaned it to my wife one time, and I found where she jotted a note in the margin one day when I was reading through it. I thought, that looks like Terry's handwriting. I don't write, and this is my preaching Bible. My study Bibles, I write all in. If I did write in this Bible both times that it mentions putting on the armor of God, I would underline the word whole because you don't want to leave gaps in that armor. Don't give place to the devil. Don't give him an inch. He will take his mile. So put on the whole armor of God. And we've studied some of this armor already, haven't we? We talked about the belt of truth. And we said that the belt of truth is what holds it all together. He says in verse number 14, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. It is the belt to which all of the other armor pieces connect without truth. The other pieces are useless. We're going to talk today about faith. Faith by itself is worth nothing. Faith in truth is the key. If somebody believes Buddha is going to take them to heaven, they are in for a terrible awakening upon their death. It's not about having faith, folks. It's about having faith in what is true. And it's the word of God. So that's what we talked about, the belt of truth. We talked about the breastplate of righteousness that points us to live a holy life, a life in obedience to God. A holy life is a powerful defense against the attacks of our enemy. When we don't live a holy life, what we do is we give Satan a beachhead in our life from which he can launch attacks. That's why D-Day was so important to the Allied invaders when they went to France. That's why D-Day was so important. It was critical that we establish that beachhead in order to eventually defeat Hitler and his regime. Satan works the exact same way. He's not a fool. And if he can establish a beachhead in my life with some little bit of compromise, he's going to take advantage of that. What's the answer? The breastplate of righteousness and then last week we looked at the shoes of peace about our foundation in Jesus. It says, having, uh, stand having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Knowing we are saved, confident that we are, we are secure in Christ, and that gives us peace of mind as we go forward. I confessed to you last week, I have very tender feet. Please don't ever take advantage of that. I just don't. I have to wear shoes. If I, I have all kinds of respect for you people that can walk out in your yards and, and enjoy walking through the grass, um, barefoot. And all. That impresses me. I, I look like a cat on a hot tin roof kind of thing if I do that. I, I just can't do it. I need shoes. If I have shoes on, I walk across my grass and I don't worry about it. If I don't have shoes on, I think to myself, what am I going to step in or on? So I do not walk with confidence. These shoes, of, uh, these shoes of peace, we have the peace of God in us so that we can go forward in a battle confident that we belong to God. We have the peace of God in us. We're putting on the whole armor of God, and today we're coming to the shield of faith. Now, up till now, we have been putting these things on. Now we're taking them up. Look at verse number 16 of, Rome, uh, of Ephesians chapter 6. Above all, well, those are important words, aren't they? We've talked about some pretty important things so far. And all of a sudden, he says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Boy, if it says above all, I probably ought to stop and think to myself, why is God putting so much emphasis on this shield? Above all, I mean, don't you think? The belt of truth is pretty important. The breastplate of righteousness, that's pretty key. The shoes of, the, of peace, those aren't, like, those aren't fringe parts of the armor. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Let's look at the shield of faith today. This message is for believers in Christ. The armor is for the person who is saved, who has had their sins forgiven, 
And this is how you are to be prepared to go into the spiritual battle. If you think, well, I don't really have any spiritual battles. You're in a battle every day. God help you if you don't know that. I think the most, I, I've said it before, I think the most vulnerable soldier is the one that he does not know. He's already on the battlefield. And Christian, you are on the battlefield. Before you got saved, can I just say this? Before you got saved, Satan could care less about what you did or thought. He didn't care. You're, you're going to hell. You're not bringing glory to God. You're, before you got saved, he had no interest in you. But when you gave your heart when you gave your heart to Christ, when he came in and he forgave your sins, when he cleansed you from all unrighteousness, and when he set you on a path from which you cannot be removed, once saved, you're saved forever. Now you're the enemy of God, or the enemy of Satan, rather. You were the enemy of God. I was the enemy of God. But now to, to be born again, to be put into God's family, I am, I am in direct opposition to everything about Satan because everything about Satan is in direct opposition to Christ. There's nothing in Satan that's for Christ, and now I'm going headlong at him, and we are at war. Every day, Christian, you're at war, so take up the shield of faith. Let's talk about what that is today and how we can deploy it in our own lives and the value that it has. Boy, Paul says, above all, taking the shield of faith. That's an important piece here. Father, thank you for your word. And we have just a few minutes to look at this, this part of the armor that you've provided for us. And Lord, we're reminded again that you have provided the armor and we have to put it on. You told us repeatedly in this passage we're to put on the whole armor of God. We are to take the shield of faith. Lord, these things are available to us but we have to appropriate them. So help us as Christians to be ready to do battle in your power. We are to be strong in the Lord and the power of your might. I pray, Lord, for those that might be here today that do not know for sure if they are going to heaven when they die. I'm so thankful that your word says we can know, that we don't have to wonder or hope. But God, you said these things were written for us so that we can know that we have eternal life so those that might be here today that do not know you, we pray that your word and your Holy Spirit would do its special work that only you can do. Convict of sin and convince them of their need for a Savior. Whether they're sitting in this room or they're back with our kids in the children's ministry, um, Lord, your word is powerful and it's quick, and we pray that it would do its work in each of us today. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Let's look at the shield, can we? First of all, how the shield is designed, how it's designed. Shields were vital to the, to the, shoulder, the soldier that was in ancient days. Today, we're into body armor, and our soldiers and uh, our, our warriors all wear body armor. But the shield was the armor back in the day. It was the main piece of their armor. And they had two common types of shields back then. Especially, they're, they're delineated in the, in the Old Testament. Do you remember reading back in like, in Saul and David's day, and then uh, also Proverbs contains a lot of the imagery, they would talk about two different types of shields. One, one's called a target, and one's called a buckler. Remember that? The target was simply a round disc-shaped shield that was strapped to a soldier's arm, and it was really for hand-to-hand -hand combat. And you've seen those in, the, in, in various movies on TV and something. It's just this little, uh, it's a little very uh, portable shield. Lightweight, but it was effective. And then there's the buckler. Well, this word that we're told here is not the word for target or small shield. It's the word for buckler. And the, the word is actually the same word that the Romans would use to describe a door. It was the word thurios. And so this thurios shield was a large door-shaped shield behind which the Roman soldier could pretty effectively hide his whole body. He could put that thing on the ground and kneel down, and he was covered. It was an, it was a, an effective piece of their armor, and much heavier than the, uh, than the small target. It could be metal. It could be wood. Uh, sometimes if it was wood, it would, be wrapped in, it would be wrapped in layers of leather. But the Roman shield was metal. Uh, and it was very good at deflecting spears and javelins and arrows and things like that. And if a, uh, if a 
soldier was going to shoot a, uh, an arrow at him, well, that, that shield deflected it. Sometimes they would shoot flaming arrows. And the Bible says that that flaming arrow against the shield of faith, it was, in, it was ineffective. So they had, this, they had these shields, and that front row of soldiers, as they advanced, they'd put those shields out front. That was the vanguard, and they'd hold that thing up. But then you had those soldiers behind them also carrying, the, behind the front row, they're carrying the same shields. And so the soldiers in the vanguard would have their, their shields out in front of them, but in the successive rows behind that, the, Roman, the, the Romans had a wonderful strategy for all of that, they would put their shields on top of that whole group of soldiers as they went. You've seen that formation before. The Romans, I don't know what their word for it was, but they called it the turtle when it was a small one, when it was a small formation of soldiers. It just looked like a turtle making its way across the ground. But did you know at times that the Romans would make that formation a mile wide? Can you imagine how formidable an opponent that would appear to be a mile wide row after row after row, looking impenetrable because all you could see were these shields. So it didn't matter if somebody was coming at the front row with swords or they were shooting arrows and javelins over the top. All they were going to hit was those Roman shields. It was a formidable defense. They used that shield just as effectively as they used their sword or their spear. So whether they were being attacked in the front or from the top, you can see why the shield was one of the most important things for a soldier to have. Now, the interesting thing was this. You could only put one soldier behind that shield. It was a personal shield. There was only one person fitting behind it. That's a pretty good object lesson, isn't it? Your dad's faith doesn't help you get into heaven. You have to have your faith. That's how the shield was designed. It was designed to be a defensive weapon, and it was going to protect them. How the shield is described. In fact, I should say this, how our shield is described, because believers, too, need a shield, not of wood, not of iron, not of leather. The Bible says that we need a shield of faith, and we exercise faith every time we go out of the house. You say, well, well, he's a person of faith or she's a person of faith. You know, every person I know is a person of faith. Every person I know is a person of faith. If you drove across a bridge to get to this church today, you are a person of faith. When you go in through it, you go under a tunnel. That that tunnel up there outside of Harrogate, if you're going up 25, you're crossing over into Kentucky, that's a long tunnel. You... From the time you enter that tunnel, you have placed your faith in the engineers that said that thing's not going to fall on your head. There's a tunnel outside of, uh, there's a tunnel over there in Norfolk, Virginia. You ever been through that one? That's a fun one. There's a tunnel over there in Norfolk that goes under the water. It goes under the bay. Uh, When I was a kid, I lived outside of Detroit, Michigan. We had the Windsor Tunnel, and you could go under the tunnel and go into Canada. And I remember one time we were going to tunnel when I was a kid. We'd go over there and get pizza in Canada, and then we'd come back. Now you have to... You have to have a passport to go over there and get pizza, and I'm not doing that. I remember one time, the, one of the younger, when I was a younger kid, one of the first times I remember driving under that Windsor Tunnel, you go under the Detroit River and you come up into Windsor, Canada. And I remember seeing water in that tunnel, and I thought, you know, I'm not the smartest man in the world, but I don't know if we ought to be seeing water with the Detroit River above our head. But every time you go over a bridge or under a tunnel, you're exercising faith. We do that all the time. We get on planes, we get in cars. Even if you're the driver of the car, you are demonstrating faith. The Bible here talks about us taking up this shield of faith. Paul is not talking about faith in your everyday living, like driving over a bridge or under a tunnel. In fact, can I go so far as to say this? It's important that you note this. Paul doesn't say here, take up the shield of the faith. It doesn't say that. It says, take up the shield of faith. He's talking here simply about our faith in God. He's referring to our faith in God. He's not talking about the body of truth that sets us apart as Christians or the body of doctrines that we hold to as Baptists. He's not talking about the faith. 
He just said, take up the shield of faith. When we talk about the faith, that body of doctrine, that's covered in the belt of truth. Now he's talking about our faith in God, the belief in Jesus Christ that brings us salvation. The faith that leads to God's blessing and provision in this journey. Faith that saves us or faith that sanctifies us or faith that supplies us. Faith that calms us down. Aren't you thankful for faith when you're going through heavy trials? Aren't you thankful for the confidence that you can have in God? That's the faith he's talking about here. Taking up the shield of faith. Faith is a necessary, non-negotiable part of the Christian armor. You and I have to live by faith. The Bible says we can't be saved apart from it. Remember our our look in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Paul says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved through faith, and we can't get around it. And then as we live our Christian's life, our Christian life, we're supposed to build that life on faith. Think of think of this little phrase. By faith. I a little word searched that on my Bible program. There were more illustrations than I could share with you today. But can I just give you a sampling of once once we are saved, how we are supposed to live our lives? The Bible says first in Romans 5, 1, that we are justified by faith. In the very next verse, it says now we have access to God by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7, we are to walk by faith. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 5, we wait in hope by faith. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38, we are to live by faith. Think of that Hebrews chapter 11. You remember Hebrews 11, the hall of faith? You remember by faith Abel did this. By faith Noah did that. By faith, by faith Abraham did this. By faith, all of these guys did this. All of these women did this. At the end of the chapter, it says, by faith, they were delivered from lions. By faith, they were sawn asunder. They went to their death, still holding to their faith in God. Everything about the Christian life is to be faith, so much so that Hebrews eleven six says this. And Christian, this ought to challenge you. It challenges me. It says, if you don't live by faith, you can't please God. For without faith, Scripture says, it is impossible to please him. This shield of faith all of a sudden sounds important. No wonder Paul said, above all, taking the shield of faith. And and I'll say this too. Your faith and my faith is only as reliable as the object in which we place it. Uh, it's, it's important. We, we said this just a moment ago. It, it's so vital that you have faith in the right object. To, to place your faith in Allah is a misplaced faith. To place your faith in Mary or the saints is a misplaced faith. Your faith, my faith, has to be in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his work on the cross. Nothing outside of that. Faith in my good works In my goodness, whatever that's going to look like, we know, don't we, from the Old Testament, we know what my goodness looks like. It's a wreck. The best I can be is a mess. Faith in Jesus Christ. I was listening to a guy talk the other day about going up in a hot air balloon, and he said, effectively, you're sitting in a wicker basket strapped to a jet engine. He said, this is not right. And that's how... You know, you're putting a lot of faith in that hot air balloon. You go up. We have it pass over the church all the time. I don't know who who owns it over in Dandridge or where they're coming from, but they pass over here all the time. And I just look up, and sometimes they're they're pretty high up there. Now, sometimes I can hear them talking. But sometimes I'm looking up there, and I'm like, boy, you've got a lot of confidence in that piece of vinyl or whatever that thing is up there. Not Mark. I'm going to be careful about where I place my faith. I can tell you right now, my faith is not in a wicker basket being suspended a thousand feet up by a jet engine. That's not going to happen. Where you place your faith, I hope, I hope, in God's name today, I hope you are not trusting in your good works to get you to heaven. And I'm not being rude and I'm not being unkind. I'm just saying that is misplaced faith. You can be as sincere as you want to be. But if your faith is misplaced, I mean, I mean something, something so simple as, 
as a rickety old chair. I mean, this is a silly little illustration, but you can put all the faith you want to in a two-legged stool. It's not going to hold you up. It does not matter how sincere you are, and that's how I feel about religious people in the world today. Muslim people, are, are they're very sincere. I know sincere Roman Catholics. I know sincere people who are trusting, in, and they're full of faith. They are people of faith. They are trusting in the fact that when they stand before God, God is going to tell them, you did more good than you did bad. Come on in. And they're wrong. The object of your faith is critical. Place your faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Someone said the true Christian faith is never disappointed because the one in whom we have faith never fails us. True Christian faith is never disappointed because the one in whom we have faith never fails. Be sure your faith is in the Lord. The shield of faith is necessary for two reasons. Number one, it's your connection to the Lord. And number two, it protects us from the enemy who desires to slay us. How do I please God? With faith. How do I quench the fiery darts of the devil? Right there in Ephesians 6, verse number 16. I do so with the shield of faith. The shield of faith is necessary because it provides our connection to the Lord and it protects us from the enemy who's desiring to slay us. How the shield is designed, it's designed for your protection. How it is described, it is the shield of faith. And I'll say this again, church. If you're not walking in faith and living by faith, you can't please the Lord. I'm not being harsh and that's not my idea, but without faith, Paul said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you can't please God. It's impossible. So this shield of faith is critical. So the last part and the biggest part of this message today is this then. If it's this important, if faith is necessary for me to please God and I can't just, I can't live by sight. I have to live by faith. The third thing is this. How do we deploy this shield then? How the shield is deployed. The Bible says the shield of faith enables us to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You've seen those flaming arrows in the movies. You know, we, we've seen them um, in the cowboy and Indian movies of the old days. And, and then if you watch any of the ancient, uh, you know, about ancient world history, you'll see these flaming arrows. They'd take an arrow and they'd wrap it in a piece of cloth. They'd dip it in pitch. And they'd light that thing on fire and there it goes. And it's an impressive sight, isn't it? When two or three hundred archers at one time loose a bunch of flaming arrows I mean, you can see that that's a, that's a terrible attack. That thing was designed when that arrow hit its target. It wasn't so much the puncture as it was the splatter of that burning pitch. Because once it hit, it would just, it would just scatter and it'd start in on anything that was combustible. Now, if it happened to hit, if it happened to hit a soft tissue body, well, that was just, that was insult to injury. Because then you got the puncture wound to deal with. But it didn't matter. That thing would still just splatter. So the ancients figured out a way they could deal with that. And that was to take those. Remember I mentioned to you before that not only were shields metal. Sometimes they were wood wrapped in leather. And layer after layer after layer of this heavy leather. They'd take those shields the night before battle. And they'd just soak them in water. And they would let that leather absorb all that. They'd let that leather absorb all that water that it could. Now it made the shield heavier but also made it where it wouldn't burn the next day when those flaming arrows hit it. That's the picture being drawn. That this, that this uh, uh, shield of faith puts out the flaming arrow of temptation that the, the enemy sends our way, and we face those temptations. I do every day. Do you? I, every day Satan comes after us. He doesn't take a holiday. We're gonna, how many of you are off work tomorrow? You're not going to work tomorrow. We're taking a holiday. Satan's not. Never has a holiday. Every day we face these temptations. Like what, Pastor? Like immorality, idolatry. And don't say that we don't struggle with idolatry in our country. We don't have little Buddhas maybe in our home, but we struggle with idolatry in our country. Envy, hatred, doubt, anger, covetousness, fear, despair, distrust, pride. 
Satan comes against us in this relentless, harsh attack, and he tempts us to sin. Like I said before, he's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything there is to know. But is he not really good at finding out what tempts you? Because what tempts you may not tempt me. Now, we may share a common temptation. That may be true. But it's almost like he knows what button to push with me. Some things, I, and you can ask my wife, some things I can just blow off. And then there are those things where, mm, boy, it just gets on my very last nerve. Like the guy said, I got one nerve and you're jumping up and down on it. You know, do you ever feel like that? Satan knows which button to push in us. That's where the shield of faith comes in. And, and I like the way, don't you like, uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't waste words, does he? He says, wherewith ye shall be able to quench, what's the next word in your Bible? All the fiery darts of the wicked. You know what that tells me? That tells me that my faith in Christ is so well placed that it does not matter the temptation or the attack that Satan sends my way. This shield of faith, this confidence in Christ is able to quench every fiery dart that he sends our way. The fiery darts of temptation have the potential to inflict great damage in our lives, but it's the shield of faith that has the power to quench them. Faith in what? Not faith in your faith. Don't do that. That is circular reasoning that leads to nothing. Faith in Jesus Christ. It says in verse number 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Our faith is not to be in us. Our faith is not to be in faith. Our faith is to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us, believers, fess this up. Every one of us have aspects of our old nature in us that's easy to ignite. And all Satan has to do is put a little flame in there. And if it gets through that chink, if it gets through that shield of faith, that's going to light up. As the arrows fly toward us and the temptations come our way, and we drop that shield of faith a little bit. We start putting more confidence in our abilities or our strength. Sometimes we start to rationalize our uh, cooperation. Is that a good way to put it? We rationalize our cooperation with these temptations. And we'll say stuff. I've had people sit in my office before. I've sat with them in a restaurant looking over a table, confronting someone about their sin. I've had people say, if God didn't want me to have this, then why did he bring it into me? Why did he bring this into my life? If God didn't want me to pursue this relationship, then why did he bring her or him into my life? As if, as if Satan had nothing to do with that. My neighbor has, my neighbor did this or has this. He seems to be happy. He seems to be doing okay. You know what we're doing, right? We're justifying our sin. We have to be so careful about this. Don't, well, if God didn't want me to have this, then he closed the door. Well, I would love to be able to say that every time I do something dumb or sinful, it's because God didn't close the door. But the fact is, I can just make dumb and sinful choices. And since I'm not a robot, God will let me make that choice. Amen. So he'll put verses in the Bible that says something like this. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the, the, end thereof are the ways of death. God will let me choose that. He'll let me choose that way. He'll let you choose that way. It's so important that we keep this shield of faith up. We justify our sin, and in doing so, we're simply saying, I want to do my will instead of God's will. I want my way instead of God's way. And that's never acceptable. It is always sin. You know what the Bible says? You want another verse about faith? This one just popped into my mind. You may have already thought of this. Help me finish this verse. Whatsoever is not of faith, do you know the next two words? Is sin. No wonder Paul said, above all, taking the shield of faith. 
And when I choose my will instead of God's, when I choose to walk by sight instead of walking by faith, I'm choosing then to sin, aren't I? Listen to Exodus chapter 20, verse number 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Well, my neighbor has it. My neighbor does it. This is the way they do things. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 7. This, this popped into my mind. In fact, this was the verse I shared when a gentleman told me, if she's not God's will for my life, then why did God bring her into my path? The first thing that came to my mind was 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Now, he was married, and she was married. So right now, I can tell you, God had nothing to do with this. And they weren't married to each other. God says, abstain from this. Walk away from it, don't touch it. Abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor, not in the lust of concupiscence like the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Walk by faith. Don't justify your sin. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Don't justify your sins. Let's not do that. We believe God's word. We have confidence in what he says. This is the way to go. The shield comes up. The arrows are quenched. And God gives us victory. Not our great strength. Not our spiritual uh, amazing power. No, it is God. We are strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You need to remember and remind yourself this daily. Satan wants to destroy you. Keep this in mind. He wants to destroy you. If he could, he'd take your life. He would. We we know that from Job's story, don't we? God said to, to Satan, you can do whatever you want, but you can't kill him. Had he not said that, I don't know that we'd have the book of Job turn out like it does. He wants to destroy you. His primary means of doing that, especially as a Christian, is to get you and to get me to sin. We sin because we have come to believe that sin can provide something for us that God can't provide. We don't sin by instinct. We sin by choice. We we choose to sin, especially as a Christian. When you have the Holy Spirit living in you, if you are tempted and you sin, don't you don't say the devil made me do it. He didn't. Your flesh gave in. I choose to sin. You choose to sin. Sin is always rooted in the doubt of God's good character. That's exactly how Satan went. He, that's exactly how he went at it with Eve. He convinced her that God was holding back, that God was ripping her off, that God was withholding something from her that would make her happy. And we sin because we've come to believe that sin will provide something for us that God can't or won't. That's Genesis chapter number 3. That idea is found in verse number uh, 16 of 1 John chapter 2. Two. Genesis 3, you see how Satan strategized and attacked Eve. In 1 John 2, 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it is not of the Father, but it's of the world. The shield of faith is vital to you to withstand these attacks. Here's this. If we would stand for the Lord against Satan's attacks, then we must do so holding up the shield of faith, believing that all God has said is true. Satan's a liar, the Bible says, and the father of it. God gives us the victory through, the, uh, through faith in him 
because what he says is true. That shield of faith, you're exercising this. God said it, and it's true, and that's where my confidence is going. And, and that, is, that is in the word of God. I, I mean, that truth is in the word of God. Our confidence has to be there. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. This is interesting, isn't it? We're talking about the shield of faith. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Psalm 18, verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Remember that word buckler? That's the big tall shield like the one we're talking about. He's a shield, a buckler to all those that trust in him. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And the faith there is implied, our faith in God. You take up the shield of faith. And you say, God, I believe that you will give me victory over this temptation. There's no temptation going to take me, but such as is common to man, and you, uh, and you have provided a way to escape. God, I'm trusting in your word. That shield of faith comes up. That fiery dart is quenched. So what is the shield of faith? The shield of faith is the trust that you have in God to give you the victory over temptation. That's the shield of faith. It's not talking about the doctrinal belief that we have, the faith. It's trust in God. It's about our faith in God, putting him above all else so that when the enemy launches those attacks and those fiery darts, like, the, like one of those big, those big massive attacks where all those darts, you ever feel like that? You know, I mentioned a minute ago those movie scenes where there's like 300 fiery arrows coming in. Do you ever feel like Satan has just unleashed his hounds after you? Shield of faith up. Because the Bible says it'll quench every one of them. It quenches all the fiery darts. It is just this simple. When we trust God, we can stand against the attacks of the enemy. The shield of faith is more than a piece of armor that's taken out for protection when we need it. The shield of faith is what makes your Christian life and my Christian life possible. It's to be an everyday thing. We are to walk by faith. We are to live by faith. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. That, that just draws the picture that faith is the lifeblood of the believer. I like, don't you like that little, that little phrase, faith to faith? We go from faith to faith. This Exercise of faith to the next exercise of faith to the next exercise of faith. We are to walk and live by faith. That faith will take you home. You know, it's interesting. You know, it's interesting about the Roman, the Romans anyway. I don't know how the others that this is true of, but it's true of the Romans. When a soldier was killed in battle, do you know how they commonly transported that soldier home? They'd put him on his shield and carry him home. Off the battlefield, back to his home, on his shield. That is a wonderful picture that says your faith in God, it will get you home. Church, take up the shield of faith. It's not your ability, it's not my ability, it's not, it's not our understanding of the scripture. It is all about our confidence in God, our faith in him, and he gives us the victory. Christian, let me ask you today, how well are you living behind this shield of faith? Here's how you can know it. Here's how you can know how well you're living behind the shield of faith. Because faith and fear are mutually exclusive. And if this world's condition and our country's economy, if the situation you or your family find themselves in, you're somehow walking in fear, you're not walking in faith. It's, there, there's a choice to be made. Are you walking by faith? Are you living by faith? 
Do you have hope in God by faith? You and I can't please God. It doesn't matter how good a Christian you are. You can't please God without faith. Now, you might be here today, and this really doesn't mean a whole lot to you. What we're doing, what we're saying doesn't mean a whole lot to you. I, I want to encourage you today to give serious consideration to this fact. If you do not belong to God's family, you do belong to Satan's family. You say, well, Pastor, I don't believe it. I don't care. I, I just don't care if you don't believe that or not. It is truth. I'm not being ugly. I'm just telling you, this is truth. If your faith is not in God to get you to heaven, the Bible is adamant about this. Hell awaits for you after you die. We've used that silly little illustration before that you may not believe 40 West will take you into Knoxville, but from exit 417, 40 West will take you into Knoxville. You say, I don't believe that. Do you see why I say I don't care? Because that's the road that goes to Knoxville. If you didn't know, if you're not from around here, that road goes to Knoxville. And there is a broad way that leadeth to destruction and every person that stays on that broad way is going to be destroyed. The great white throne judgment, the terrible thing about the great white throne judgment is this. Every person there is eternally condemned. You have no advocate. There's only a prosecutor at the great white throne judgment. There's no advocate. There's a prosecutor and a judge. And that's it. Every person is condemned there. I would encourage you to take up the shield of faith and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And then walk by faith and live by faith. Faith, your instruction is here. This is God's word for you today. Taking, above all, taking up the shield of faith that you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the, of, the, of the devil. That's what you want. That's what I want. That's absolutely what we need. Would you stand today with your heads bowed? Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for its clarity, and this shield is important to me. It's more important than sometimes I admit. And, Lord, there are those times when I walk by sight or I allow fear to creep into my heart or mind. I don't take faith in you all that seriously, and I should. And, Lord, maybe there's folks like that that are living their whole lives like that today. First, I would pray for any person in this room that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And above everything else, God, I pray that they would come to know you as the one who takes away all of our sin and all of its penalty forever. And then I pray for the Christian, Lord, who might be in here today who struggles living by faith. Worry and doubt and confusion rules their mind more often than not. They're concerned about um, the things that are happening in this world more than they are about their walk with you in faith and knowing God, confidently knowing that you have all things in control. You are working things to a glorious end, and we're, wet, we're ready for that. We are waiting for it. But, Lord, there may be Christians in here today who their faith needs help. So we would pray like the disciples did. Lord, would you increase our faith and help us to walk more with you. And, um, God, know your peace and your strength. We, we do want to fight this battle in your strength and not ours, so show us how to do that. I pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Would you hold your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment? I want you to pray. In your heart, God, what is this message to me today? What is it to do in my heart? First, God may be calling you to be saved if you're not saved. Come and let someone show you from the Bible how you can know how to be saved today. Would you do that? And then you, Christian, you may need to come today and say, God, I want you to increase my faith. I'm not living by faith. I'm kind of making my own way through this world and doing my own thing. 
you need to join this church today, come. Whatever God might be doing in your heart today, come and let him have his way in your life. Would you do that? Amen. Thank you. You can look up this way. I appreciate your attention this morning. I appreciate your attendance. I'm glad you're here. Holiday weekend and you're in God's house and I'm glad for it. We're so thankful to have Brenda Dockery come to join our church today. Um, she's coming by a transfer of letter from the Deep Springs Baptist Church over in Newmarket. And uh, I want you to be in prayer for Brenda. This is Jeff's mom, of course. Many of you know her. She's come for a long time. I've said this before. I appreciate people who take their time um, in determining if God is moving them from one church to another. That's a big deal. I think in, oftentimes in our, can I just pause for a minute and say in Christian culture today, in America anyway, church hopping is ridiculous. And I, I appreciate those who investigate, God, are you moving me from one family to another? And Brenda's been coming for a long time, months and months, 15 months and praying and seeking God's direction. Now, I think it's scriptural to be a member of a church. I, I do. I think the Bible teaches that. But I also believe that we, once you're in a church, boy, get there and serve. And I just prayed with Brenda, and I, I prayed for her to know where God would have her serve in this church. And I want you to join her in prayer with that. Um, and I'm so thankful God brought her our way. I believe this is a faithful woman of God. She loves the Lord. She loves his word. And she's faithful. Um, and I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate her coming today and desiring membership here. All of those in favor of her membership at Faith Baptist Church, would you just raise your hand and say amen? Amen. amen? amen. We'll wait for that letter from Deep Springs Baptist, and we'll look forward to that. I would like you to come and greet Brenda this morning. If you don't know her, um, you need to come and introduce yourself to her church family and then get to know her. Find occasions uh, to get to know these folks that are joining our church and their members here. Look for opportunities for fellowship. Terry's going to stand with her down here. I told Brenda, I said, I'll have Terry stand down here so you're not by yourself. Um, but please come and meet her after we're dismissed in prayer and come by and give her the right hand of fellowship and uh, let her know that you'll be praying with her as she seeks where to serve the Lord at Faith Baptist Church. All right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll be dismissed. And then you come and, and greet Brenda if you would. And then, Lord willing, we'll see you back here tonight at 6. God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for these folks who've gathered in this particular church this morning, and I pray that your word will do its effective work in each of our hearts. Thank you for bringing Brenda Dockery to Faith Baptist Church. Thank you, Lord, for her testimony of belief in Jesus Christ, her baptism, and her desire here to serve the Lord and worship you here. And I pray that you would help us to welcome her into this church body. And, Lord, add to this church as you see fit. Uh, this is your church. And Jesus, we confess again that you are our head, and so help us to be the body that we should, edifying itself in love and every part performing uh, its function here. Bless our day. Give us a good service tonight as we go back into your word. We fellowship and worship together. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church.